Hi there. Thank you for that, uh, Yasmina. <clears throat> Just want to say uh, a good morning, a good afternoon, good evening, good night. It seems we have the entire world um, in here at the moment. So um, quite exciting for me as well, because even though I've done lots of things like this before, uh, well, not exactly like this, but I've never done one to quite so many people. Um, I don't know if I'm meant to share any numbers, but we have, uh, you know, many hundreds uh, signed up for this. So hopefully most of you have turned up um, or are possibly watching this on the recorded video, which I know is uh, also being done. Um, and I, I think the audio may even be better on that. So if there's major problems with the audio, we are recording. Um, so yeah, as we can see here, powering up Node. Now, you may have thought you was, you know, kind of signed up just to do, you know, this chat room thing. Um, and I think that selling something as being, you know, we're going to build a thing um, is a really good way to go. But ultimately, this is all about um, learning the, the absolute basics of Node.js. Um, so at a technological level, that's the main thing that we're going to be working with. But then we're going to be sewing some other things into that to, you know, get everything working and actually produce the, the chat room that was promised in the schedule. So um, let's move on. Now, I should, I should share at this point, I am totally new to this system as well. So hopefully I don't get anything wrong. Um, but uh, if I do, I shall correct it very quickly. So move on to the next slide. Okay, so as I just said, our goal, we're going to make a simple multi-user real-time chat page, and it's pretty much going to use JavaScript from front to back. Uh, there's a couple of other technologies that mix in with it along the way, but um, the core of the, what you're actually going to work with and what you're actually going to use if you end up reproducing this uh, chat system for yourself and running it on your own server or running it on your own Heroku account or whatever, pretty much everything is JavaScript. So we're not going to dig anything too advanced today. This is you know, quite a short webinar, really. Um, it's not hours and hours of training. Uh, we're going to stick to the basics. So we're going to cover Node. We're going to cover the basics just to get to that chat room. We're not going to do lots of things like authentication and uh, you know, extending it with extra features and stuff like that. Um, those are sort of what I would say are exercises that are left for the reader. Uh, those are the bit in the book at the end where it says, here's some challenges for you to do. So um, I'll mention what some of those are uh, towards the end of this talk. Um, so that you can try and add some things if you want. But, you know, as is, this will be useful for you, um, hopefully anyway. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on uh, me, really. You know, this is all about uh, sharing information. Um, but as Yasmina already mentioned, um, I am the co-chair of O'Reilly Fluent, which I'll talk about just a little bit more in a minute. Um, but other than that, you may know me from, uh, I run several different newsletters. So I run a newsletter called JavaScript Weekly. Um, I run one called HTML5 Weekly and some others uh, on other technologies like Ruby Weekly, for example. And, um, you know, they've, they've gone very well, and that's part of the reason I was invited in to do um, the Fluent conference, because, you know, I, I know lots of people, and I know the technologies and stuff like that. Um, I'm definitely not quite up there with, uh, you know, the, the hardcore developers, uh, you know, like the Brendan Ikes and the Yehuda Katzes of the world. But uh, in terms of knowing, you know, what's going on and what's around and how to join things together, that's uh, sort of my main area, I guess. Um, so yeah, very nice to meet you all today. And if you want to catch up with me at all online, you can just follow me at uh, Peter C on Twitter. So twitter.com forward slash P-E-T-E-R-C, and you can follow me on there. Um, and I just post lots of stuff to do with JavaScript and Ruby and development in general. So I just mentioned the uh, O'Reilly Fluent Conference. It's something that's taking place uh, late next month. So yeah, May 29th through 31st. And we have a day of workshops and then two days of presentations. And it's been absolutely crazy putting together. It's uh, quite hard work putting together an event. So uh, a big learning experience for me as it's my first one that I've been involved with. Um, my co-chair, though, is um, Brady Forrest. He's the guy who came up with the in, um, was it Ignite uh, form of uh, you know, lightning talks. Um, so a very interesting guy, um, and we've put together a pretty good show uh, for you. So if you're interested in coming along, um, it's in San Francisco next month, and as you can see, there's a code on this slide that will let you save 20% on the, um, the going rate to come in. But I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Obviously, that's you know, a key part of why we uh, do these webinars and things. It's to help promote the conference, but ultimately, you know, my goal here is really to uh, share some knowledge with you and hopefully get your developing Node.js app. So let's move on to that part now. Oh, and we'll put that information back up at the end, uh, you know, just in case you are interested at that point. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of, you know, what we're going to connect together. I'm then going to dig into Node.js. 
I'm going to have a quick look at how node modules work. This isn't entirely relevant to the, um, the topic at hand, but knowing how the modules work in Node is still very useful if you then want to move on to work with it. I'm then going to show you something called Fay, which is what we will use to connect our server with the browser for doing our real-time chat. I'm then going to do some uh, browser work, so we're actually going to produce you know, the HTML and uh, the JavaScript on the client side. And then, last but not least, we will do some deployment. Now, somewhere in the middle of all of this, I will be taking um, perhaps just one or two minutes uh, pause just to have a drink and that, because my voice uh, tends to give up after about half an hour. So. <laughs> um, so there we go. And there seems to be someone in the chat room who's also got the same name as me, which is very interesting. So there you go, trivia for the day. Um, right, so the key things we're going to focus on, the back end, the front end, deployment. So what are we going to use on the back end? Well, the back end, as I've already mentioned, is going to be Node.js, and we're going to use Fay, which is essentially a, uh, a library that you can use on both the back end and the front end to do um, browser to server communications, um, for doing real-time communications. It will also fall back to doing things like um, polling, which you know is where it will check every certain number of seconds for um, requests and things like that if your browser can't support uh, the various polling techniques, but pretty much all of them can now. Um, you may also be familiar with another system called Socket.io, which is very similar, um, and you could use that instead of Fay. The, the API is very similar. Um, and someone's just asked in the channel, is Fay like Socket.io? It is. Um, and yeah, if I see any really, really quick questions as I'm going along, we'll answer them as I go. Um, but anything that's longer, we'll do it at the end in the, uh, the official way. So the front end. Um, the front end is just going to be HTML, plain old JavaScript that has a little bit of uh, jQuery mixed in. We're going to do some templating. So this is something I thought was quite interesting. We can uh, put like a little dynamic template directly into the HTML that we can then use to put our chat messages on the screen. Um, and again, we're going to use Fay. Last but not least, the deployment section, we are going to use Heroku. You could use your own server and things like that. I'll explain what you could do in that situation. But just for this, we're going to use Heroku. So right, let's get to the meat of this. Um, first, I'm going to go through and just talk about what Node is and explain some of its concepts. But then I'm going to be going to a live coding session. So that will open in a separate window, and you'll actually be able to see me um, doing stuff live and looking at code and so on. So what is Node? Um, well, essentially, it's a non-browser environment for running JavaScript code. Uh, it basically is a mix of a platform that Google developed called V8, uh, which is a JavaScript engine they developed to use in their Chrome browser. Now, I use Chrome, excellent browser. I think it's probably the best one out there at the moment. Um, but they developed this JavaScript engine for it, and they put so much effort into it. There's some really great people on the V8 team who really know their stuff, and it's super duper fast. So um, Isaac, uh, not Isaac Sluter, uh, Ryan Dahl, um, who works for Joyent, he came along and he bundled V8 and thought, hang on, if you've got this engine that can go in a browser, perhaps I can take it you know, on its own independently, attach a nice API to the front of it, make it so it's easy to run, um, and then you could use it on the server side. That's exactly what he did, and that's where um, Node.js comes from. So Node.js, really, the, the, the genius in Node.js isn't necessarily the stuff that Ryan wrote, Good as it is, um, the genius is the underlying V8 JavaScript engine, um, and then Node provides a bunch of APIs on the top to do practical things with it. So I guess I've just kind of explained that, but really one of the other things that's worth knowing about Node is it does include a standard library, so there's lots of standard functionality in it that you know, doesn't come with V8. V8 is just a JavaScript engine, just raw JavaScript, whereas Node adds all this stuff on the top, like a standard library, um, a package manager, which we're going to look at, um, called NPM, um, and various other different handy features, and the whole community, because people are organized around Node as a community rather than V8 in particular, because it branches off into you know, browsers and all different areas that V8 is used. Now, just to, I, I like to use some visuals, um, just so you get an idea. This is Ryan Dahl, the guy who created Node.js. If you see him at uh, a conference or whatever, you know, feel free to buy him a beer or whatever. Um, but recently, I think it's about two months ago, he, and for anyone who's watching the recording, this is uh, early 2012, um, he handed over the kind of the leadership of the project to a guy called Isaac Schluter, who um, I think came up with the NPM uh, package system. Could be wrong, I think he did. Um, and I just really like this uh, illustration that someone did of this whole thing, you know, um, 
Ryan's handing over the, the, the node crown to uh, Isaac Schluter. And someone's confirming that Isaac Schluter did come up with NPM in the channel, so thank you for that. Um, so server-side, what's the big deal about server-side? Well, if you think of something like uh, Ruby or Python or PHP, all those languages where you're used to opening a terminal and you know, it all just runs locally on your own machine, you know, it's not in a browser or anything along those lines, well, that's exactly what we're going for with um, Node.js. It doesn't have to actually run on a server somewhere on the internet. It can just run on your local machine. Um, but we use the term server side just to you know, emphasize the difference between the server side and the client side, or the back end and the front end. Now, sometimes people say, you know, why would you want to develop server side in JavaScript, or something like that? Now, I'm hoping most of you, you know, who are on this have already been convinced of the value of JavaScript, because that's why we're all here. Um, but I should just re-emphasize that, you know, thanks to Google and their work on V8, and then, you know, that's kind of motivated so many people to do much better work with their JavaScript engines, like Firefox, for example. Um, you know, their, their engine's now really quick, and Opera have got theirs, and IE are working on theirs. Um, V8 really gave all of them a kick in the behind and made JavaScript really fast. So now, you know, it's great. You can use a single language on the front end and the back end. You don't have to, if you don't want to, have, like, let's say, a Rails app or a PHP app or a, a .NET um, MVC app or whatever um, in the back end and then JavaScript just on the front end. You can have both of them you know, doing all of the work. So thanks to uh, V8 and to Node for that. So what is it useful for, for doing stuff server-side? Well, it's the same as what you would do with PHP or Ruby or anything like that. Uh, it's just good for network services generally. You know, anything that requires a server and has various clients attaching to it, um, APIs, scoreboards, um, and you know, what we're going to look at here, live chat. So just to quickly go over a couple of the benefits of Node. Um, Node is single-threaded from a developer's point of view. So if you are using um, Node and writing code in Node, uh, you don't run into lots of different problems with handling different threads and you know, needing to do locking of resources and having all these different horrible race conditions and all this type of stuff that, you know, most people think they need like a computer science degree just to understand um, how to do um, you know, multi-threaded stuff. Um, it can get quite complicated. Now, I say it's single-threaded, but just so that no one picks me up on this, um, Node actually does use threads under the hood. Um, it has a thing called a thread pool, and it uses this for um, blocking I.O. and stuff like that. But Node handles that for you. you when you're coding, um, writing in Node, you don't have to worry about threading and concurrency and stuff like that quite so much as you do with uh, other languages. So it makes Node very simple for putting together these services initially. I mean, once you get up to having like tens of thousands of clients all attaching at once, you probably need to start learning a bit more. Um, but just from the basic point of view, when you're learning, until you become super duper advanced, don't worry about uh, threading or concurrency or whatever. And I've just seen a question about this, which I'll answer at the end. Um, so part of this whole single threaded thing is that Node is event-driven. This is how it can get away with um, that kind of approach. So what does event-driven mean? Well, if you think of how the browser works and how JavaScript works in the browser, if you perform a very long, laborious uh, you know, calculation um, in JavaScript in the browser, it can sometimes lock the browser up. Um, and this is basically because it's blocking. It's using a lot of CPU, and it's blocking up um, anything else from happening. Well, if you do something in an event-driven way, uh, what you do is, is you have callbacks all over the place. Now, you may have seen this if you've done a lot of JavaScript development where um, you may ask uh, jQuery, for example, to make an AJAX request to the server and then do something with the response. Well, if you do um, an AJAX request and let's say it was entirely synchronous, so it's all, you know, you're waiting on that response, then pretty much everything would lock up um, until the response came back from the server. And that wouldn't be cool. You might take 10 seconds or something for something to come back. So what you do is, is you create a separate function called a callback uh, that then has what you want to do with the result in it. And you, you give that to jQuery. You say, make this um, request to the server. Uh, here's the URL. Here's the callback function off you go. And it immediately does that, um, and then you can carry on running the rest of your JavaScript. And then once, um, behind the scenes, JavaScript's done the fetching, and jQuery's done the fetching and the processing, it will then run that callback function that you defined earlier. Um, and this is pretty much the core of the whole event-driven thing. And 
if you've done any development on the desktop, for example, so I am not a big desktop person, but I did uh, desktop development in the 90s with Visual Basic. This is where I uh, show off just how not cool I am. Um, you may be familiar with that type of uh, event-driven thing because you have different widgets on the screen, different controls on the screen, um, and you, you don't want to sit there checking for what's going on all the time. You literally just say, if this button's clicked, do this. If this button's clicked, run this. Um, Think of that type of thing. And this is comparable to other systems in other languages, um, like Event Machine in uh, Ruby, for example, and uh, Twisted in Python. Who's using this node thing? Uh, again, we probably don't need to be convinced of this, but it's just a list of people that are uh, you know, using it. Um, it's hot stuff, yada, yada. We're not going to focus on this a bit too much. So we are now going to move on to the live bit. Um, we're going to very quickly look at installing Node, look at the, uh, the REPL environment it provides, um, make a simple program, do some modules, start working with Fay, um, and um, move on to actually producing the live chat before we do uh, a deployment. So this is where I now start getting experimental. And I will now just, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the um, screen sharing. So what will happen is something should pop up um, in your uh, system that you're using to watch this so you can see what's going on. Um, but we will double check that. I'm just going to get it up started now. OK. So Node.js, I'm just going to bring a browser into uh, the view here. <clears throat> so if you haven't used Node.js at all yet, you know, some of you have probably got it already installed and already playing with it. If not, uh, come along, just search for Node.js. It's available at nodejs.org. Go along to the main site. Um, they have a download link, and it's very, very simple. You can just you know, bring up the Windows installer, Macintosh installer. Um, if you're you know, really that way inclined, you can work with the source code and compile it yourself and all that type of thing. Um, if you are on um, OS uh, 10, you could be here at a terminal prompt, and if you're using something called Homebrew, which is quite common, you can do a brew install node um, to bring that up. Um, the only problem with doing a brew install node is you often need to install other things and set environment settings and stuff like that separately. Um, so you'll need to look at the documentation for that because it's a bit too much to go into here. Um, but yeah, it's all possible to do. So let's say that we've got our node all up and running and everything is cool. Now, I'm going to increase the font size here so you can actually see what's going on. Um, I'm sort of dragging a little bit here because I see a few people in the channel having problems getting onto the screen sharing, so I'm not moving too quickly at this bit. Um, but we'll speed up as I go along. So I've got Node running. If I type Node-V, this will tell me what version I'm running. And I'm running uh, a kind of an edge version um, that perhaps I shouldn't be running um, because there was a bug in an earlier version of Node. So I needed to upgrade, unfortunately. Um, you'll probably be running, what is it, 0615 at the moment. Um, if you're watching this on the recording, of course, you may be on version 1 by now. Who knows? Um, so Node is running. It can run JavaScript. Now, I use this all the time for doing little kind of com um, calculations and things like that. If you type Node and you press Enter, it just comes up with a very simple prompt. And this is called REPL, which stands for Read, Evaluate, Print, Loop, essentially. So what that means is it reads the input from the keyboard. It will then run that in the context of whatever you're in. Uh, it will print the result out to the screen. That will loop back around to the start. So for example, I've got my node prompt up here. I can just type 1 plus 1. That's fine. Uh, I can do things like uh, var x, this is a test. And then I can do um, console log x and all that type of thing. Um, so you can do very basic little you know, playing around with uh, JavaScript in here. Um, it's very, very simple. It's really just a play around. And you can learn a few things and stuff like that in here. Um, and just for the benefit of anyone who's you know, not getting the screen share yet, I'm in the REPL environment, and I'm typing in very basic bits of JavaScript um, so you can see how they work. But there's no point in dwelling on that. Let's move on to something a little bit more advanced. So we'll get out of there. And I shall bring up my text mate. Right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create something that's called supersimple.js in my text editor here. And sorry this is like really low res. I, would, I often use different tools and things like that, but because I've tried to cram it into the res, I'm keeping it as super simple as possible, typing everything from scratch, um, just so that everyone can follow and understand. 
So I've created a file here called supersimple.js, and I can literally just put in something like, you know, this is the test, blah, 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 blah. And I know this is super elementary. We're all going to speed up. Save that. Come out to the command line, run supersimple.js, node supersimple.js, and bam, it runs. So this is the absolute basic way of you know, running um, a JavaScript app that's targeting node at the command line. Super duper simple, very, very easy. Let's move on to something a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to create something called um, Server 1. And what Server 1 is all about is we're going to focus on node strength. Now, node strength is working with network services, so things over HTTP and stuff like that. And node comes built in with an HTTP server, so a web server, essentially. And I'm just going to type in the basic code just to get that up and running. Uh, what we can do is here, I'll just explain each line as I go, just so it hopefully will sink in by the time we've done this about 10 times. Um, I'm loading up a uh, library that comes in with um, node, and I'm um, assigning it to a variable called HTTP. I'm now going to create a, a server object using HTTP create server, and I'm going to take a request and a response from that. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use the response to write out um, an HTTP uh, response. So I'm going to create something called a content type. I'm going to send text plain rather than HTML over the wire, just because it's easier for now. And then I'm going to end my um, session by, you know, just doing like a hello world type thing. So now we've got our server. And this is essentially like almost like a callback in a way. You know, it's not actually running this code immediately right now. It's just creating the server. And then this code will be run every time that our, whoops, every time that our, uh, you know, server is hit with a, um, a, web, you know, a web client or a curl or something along those lines. Next, we need to tell the server to actually start doing something. So I'm going to make it listen on port 8000. You could put whatever port number you want in there. Um, ideally, keep it to a high number so you don't have any clashes or anything. Uh, if you need to listen on a certain interface, you can put in um, information at the end here. But just to have it running on localhost, uh, just do server.listen like that. Um, and then last but not least, we'll just do a console log just to say that the, yeah, the server is running, essentially. So I'll just put in some information here, like so, um, and semicolon at the end. So this is super duper simple. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to come out and I'm going to run server one. Comes up straight away, gives us this URL. What I'm going to then do is I'm going to create a new tab in my terminal here. Oops, increase the font size again. And what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a command line tool called curl. In fact, actually, I don't need to do this, but I'll just show you. Curl, it loads up the Hello World. I'm actually going to use the web browser just in case it's curl is new to you um, at all. If I do it in the web browser and I run that, that now hits our Node app and returns us the Hello World. So very, very simple. And of course, you know, you could extend this. Um, with, you know, a lot more stuff. Um, you could actually put in some, uh, you know, HTML and put an H1 tag in and stuff along these lines, change this to HTML, um, save that, reload. And then if I bring the browser up again, I reload that. Now you can see we've got a proper heading um, coming up in here. So very, very, very simple. Now just to show off some of the... Um, you know, the underlying uh, benefits of using Node um, and how it acts a little bit like the, um, you know, the web browser, um, you know, JavaScript in the web browser. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put, um, actually, uh, yeah, this is a test. And then at the end, and now we're finished. And just to make this super duper simple, I'm going to cut that out and change it back to text plain again. But what I'm going to do um, is I'm not just going to let that request, you know, occur straight away. Um, oh, someone's just asked, does the server terminate after the first request? No. Um, and actually, this is a point that I'm just about to get to, is that Node is clever enough to know when there are callbacks and when there are active things being waited upon, and it won't exit uh, if that's the case. You have to explicitly make Node quit the process if that's going to happen. Um, so that's how it can keep running the server constantly without us having to do a loop of any sort. So, what I'm going to do um, is you're probably familiar with something called um, set timeout, and what that will allow us to do is we can um, have a function 
contains some code like our response end. Now I'm getting a mess here. Um, and say, right, can you run that after two seconds, please? So what will happen here is when we get a request, it will write out this is a test immediately, but then we tell set timeout, you know, only finish the request after two seconds. So we're adding like a, you know, a delay into the whole thing. And this could be important um, if you've got a long-running thing that wants to send lots of data over the wire that may not all be ready yet. You can still push stuff over the wire and delay and send the rest later. So if I close that and then rerun it again, if I do a request in curl again, watch this. Now, this is all partly to do with buffers, but um, you can see that it takes two seconds for the whole thing to come back. It's not instant. Um, we can make some tweaks to that to make the first bit come out first, um, which I can never remember this very well, but hopefully will this uh, resolve the problem. Yeah, there we go. Um, so I've sent a new line character along, essentially. So it sends that this is a test, um, clears the buffer, um, or flushes the buffer, rather, and then sends the end, now we're finished after two seconds. And if we load in the browser, browser acts a little bit differently in this case, but you can still see it takes the two seconds. So you think, OK, well, that kind of you know, is interesting. But what does this mean if we have multiple things going on at the same time? So I'll open up another tab. Now, does it mean that we're blocking for those whole two seconds and then no other clients can connect to this HTTP server? Well, no. If I load up two at once, you can see they're both running at the same time. Um, and just in case that was a little bit difficult to see, what I will do is I'll do, with Apache Bench, I'll do 100 requests to our server, um, and I'll have five um, things you know, going on it at the same time. If I actually know, we'll update that a bit. Let's turn this down. We'll have 50, and we'll do 10 at the same time. I'll put in our URL. I need to get rid of the curl, of course. And, ooh, there we go. Right, I'll run that. And now you think, well, if we're doing 50 requests, it might end up taking 100 seconds. Um, but it won't. Which is where I get really embarrassed now when it takes 50 seconds. Um, no, there we go. So what's happened is it has taken 10 seconds. Now, the reason for that is that it's waiting two seconds on every single request. We're doing, um, you know, it's only sending a certain number of requests along at once. Uh, so it doesn't have to wait for 50 times 2, which would be 100 seconds. It's waiting a lot less. Now, I'm not entirely sure why it's waiting for 10 when I thought it should be 20. But there you go. Um, it's actually acting better than I thought it was going to act. Uh, but either way, the key point here is it's not blocking and blocking up the whole request. So let's move on to modules because they're such an important part of Node. So we built something that's super duper simple there, very, very simple server. Now, let's say you want to just make this slightly more complex. Uh, you know, what we've just done there is really, really scrappy and simple. Well, if you've used a language like, let's say, uh, Ruby, for example, you may be familiar with something called the um, Ruby gem system. So this is where you have different, lots of different libraries that perform different functions, and you can install them um, with a command like gem install and then the name of the library you want to install. Um, and it's simple. There's other ones for Python. I think there's... Um, what's it? You can do easy install with Python and with PHP. You got Pear and stuff like that. Uh, Perl, you've got. Uh, oh, this is funny. I did Perl for eight years. And I have such a bad memory. Um, but either way, Node.js equivalent is called npm. So it's very very simple to use. And as of um, the recent versions of Node, um, it actually comes. Uh, with Node. It used to be a completely separate system, but now it actually comes with Node. So we can do things like, and we're going to be using this in a minute, um, someone's reminded me, Perl is CPAN. Of course it is. Thank you very much. Um, npm install fay. So this is to load up a library that we can find on the internet. And let me just bring that up for you. Uh, well, I shouldn't have to search for fay library, should I? It's a really bad way of doing it. I'll just search for fay because it comes up first. So Fay is a library that works for Node.js and in the browser. Um, there's some examples of how to use it and so on. We're going to do this in a minute. Um, but to install that module in Node, just do npm install Fay and bam, you can start using it straight away. So if I bring up that REPL environment again, I can do stuff like this, for example. And you know, then Fay is an object that has tons of different methods and so forth on it that we can then use to get the functionality we need. Um, actually, quite a lot of stuff. More stuff than I thought it was going to be. Um, but it's that simple. npm install Fay, bam, you're good to go. So how do these modules work? Um, I'm not going to dig into like how to create an entire module, uh, but how does it work at a very basic level? How does this require work? How does it bring something in? Because 
if you are working with JavaScript in the web browser and you're not using things like Require.js, for example, or AMD modules and things like that, you may not be familiar with you know, how exactly can you load in other JavaScript files from another one and all that type of stuff. So just because of the time, I'm going to cut back to ones that I've already you know, produced already. Uh, so what we've got here is I've got a file called module test. Now in this, literally like my code we saw earlier, I'm doing var my mod equals and then load up the my module file, please. Uh, very, very simple. And then I'm just printing to the screen. I'm taking that my mod object and calling a something function that was attached to it. So if we go and look at the my mod file, very, very simple. All you need to do in a very, very basic module is use the um, exports variable. And the exports variable basically returns, you know, whatever is in the exports variable in a module then goes back to whatever called, you know, did the require on the module. So this exports essentially moves to here. So when you're doing my mod equals require my mod, my mod sets stuff on exports. So it could even just be exports equals 10, you know, and if you came back to here, my mod would now equals 10. Uh, that's not very useful. Um, so what we're going to do is instead we'll say exports dot something, you know, we'll set um, uh, you know, property on here, sign it a function, and then we'll just return 10 through there. So then if I run module test, hopefully you can guess what the result's going to be. There we go. Number 10 comes out. Um, very, very simple. So you can, you can add extra files to this to be able to package it up as a proper NPM module, um, and then you can push it up to where all the NPM modules are hosted, so that then someone could come along and do something like NPM install my mod. Um, there are lots of different tutorials out there about how to do that. Um, we're not going to go into that because we're not going to build a library today. Um, but it's possible, and it's very, very simple. It's even easier than in Ruby. So if you're familiar with Ruby and how easy it is to make a gem, even easier in JavaScript. Just to quickly look at a second uh, example of using a module, this is a bit more advanced and a bit more how uh, Faye, for example, would do it. So in this case, what we're doing is we're loading in the user file. So this is user.js, which I've got down here. And what I'm doing is I'm bringing that into a variable called user. I'm using capital U because it kind of uh, is, is a constructor, essentially. And, you know, that's the, uh, the convention for constructors in JavaScript. And then what I'm doing is I'm creating a new user, um, passing in the name Fred, and then I'm going to ask that user, what is your name? And it will print Fred out again. How does this look from the user.js side of things? Very, very simple again. Um, now, this actually slightly contravenes the common JS spec that's used for these modules, but it's a common pattern in uh, Node to do it this way. Um, so what I've done is I've uh, created a constructor function here, and it accepts a name. Um, you know, assigns it to the, the current object, and then what we do is, um, you can't just do this at exports.user, you need to put module.exports.equals user in the front of it, there's always horrible reasons why you need to do that, but just do it in this case. Um, assign the user function to that, and then what that will allow you to do is, we come back to here, now this user equals this, so it loads up brings in this function, so then we have this constructor available to us. So then once we pass in the name and then we query the name, it will all just work. So if I just quickly run that up for you, it's very, very simple. We get Fred. So this is how libraries like Fay um, handle this uh, because, you know, they have a lot of things going on with inside them. They're not just returning the number 10 or Fred or anything like that. They have lots of functions and, you know, lots of complicated stuff going on, and that is how they would return their constructor or whatever it is that they want you to work with. So let's move on to the practical section of this. You know, let's actually build a simple chat system. We are going to use something that I've already mentioned called Fay. Now, here is the home page for Fay. Um, essentially, it's a library that you know, allows you to do what they call PubSub messaging. And what is PubSub messaging? It's essentially a system where you can publish information into a server, um, or you can subscribe to receive information from a server. So let's say, um, like if you've used Usenet in news groups, there's kind of a similar concept there. 
um, or like a forum or something like that. You know, you subscribe to something that has a certain name, and then people can publish information into that channel. And then if you're subscribed to that channel, you get the information coming back out. Um, an IRC chat room, you know, or any sort of chat room actually would be a very similar um, kind of model for that type of thing. And FAI allows you to do that. It uses something called the BIO, um, BIO um, protocol. And the BIO protocol essentially just defines an interface for doing this pub sub messaging over the web. Um, it doesn't care too much about how the messages get across the wire, um, which is why FAI supports different techniques. It can use WebSocket. Um, it can use polling. It can use uh, Comet. Um, which is like a long, um, you know, a long polling process. We're not too worried about that. Um, we're just going to use FAI and let it abstract away all of our pain. Um, so you can see how to install uh, FAI. I already did it once, but just to quickly show you again, just do an npm install FAI in your uh, project folder if you want. Um, I will show you um, a little bit later how you can define these things in a file. So you can just do an npm install and it will just work uh, without you specifying the names of things. Uh, but we'll just do it the manual way for now so you get the, you get the idea. So we do npm install FAI, bam, off we go. Um, and someone's asking the channel, is FAI based on XMPP? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not, no, um, as far as I understand. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to create something really simple. Now, we don't want to just jump straight into making a, a web page and a server and doing it all in one go. Um, you can do that once you get hold of my code file that you can download, and you can play with it that way yourself. But we are going to um, start with something very, very basic first. Now, again, just because of the time, um, it's got a little bit slower than I thought I uh, would be. Um, I'm actually just going to show you the code that I've already made um, for certain bits of this. So the first thing we need to do um, is fight, uh, create a FAI server. So this is the server that sits in the middle and allow people to publish stuff to it and subscribe to messages coming from it. And it's super duper simple, to be honest. I mean, I could probably type this in about five minutes. Um, but here you go. So what we're doing is uh, we create, as before, in our first file, create um, an HTTP server. So bring in the module for that. We bring in the FAI module. And I just realized that I really should take this, uh, stick to this technique with this one. Um, and then what we do is FAI will then use the HTTP library to create an HTTP server, but then FAI will attach to it um, and offer all of its different functionality up completely generically. So what we're going to do is we will just run that as is. And nothing happens. You know, I've not printed out anything to the screen. It's just sitting there waiting for uh, you know, um, connections to come up. Well, luckily, we can do that by creating a FAI client. Um, and perhaps I will just do this one live just so you can get uh, an idea of how it works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file here called FAI client 2. And what we'll do is um, all we need to do this time is we just need to load in uh, FAI like so. Uh, I'm going to create a client. So what we'll do is this is a slightly different part of FAI's functionality. We then tell it you know, where to look. Uh, for that FAI server, so it's on port 8001 on the local host. Um, we then are going to uh, publish something to it. Um, so what we'll do is, whoops, we'll do a client publish, and I'm going to choose a channel. I'm going to say we want to pu publish to a channel called messages, so that's fine. Uh, then I pass in a JavaScript object, and I can pretty much pass in whatever I like at this point, but I'm going to um, do something like hello world. And what would happen if I ran this code is it would kind of send the message, but then it wouldn't quit. So enough something else I want to do is I want to make sure that the process actually quits um, once it's sent the message. So very, very simple. And if I run um, FAI client 2, it, it just does stuff. You, know, it's, you can't see what's happening. And at the server end, again, you can't see what's happening. So we need the next part of the equation. And this is the thing that's going to subscribe to the messages channel and actually receive the messages that we want to send over the wire. So you can think of this client as being like a, a browser chat client that's sending text to the FAI server. But now we need the thing that actually reads the stuff back from the server. So I'm going to create another file called FAI client 3. Um, and actually, we can steal some of the stuff from, uh, we'll steal the FAI client 2. We'll bring that in. Um, you know, we actually need something that's going to listen to the messages now. So we can keep the, that bit and the client the same. 
But now what we need to do is we're going to say, client, can you please subscribe to the messages channel? Um, uh, whoops. Uh, should use my auto complete for that. Uh, like so, we're going to pass in a callback. Whenever we receive a message from that subscription, we then want to print out what we got. So I say, um, I've got a message. And remember we passed in that um, JavaScript object that had the text property set? Well, literally, we get back that JavaScript object here as the message, and we can call, um, get into that uh, property here. So now, if we you know, pretty much tie all of this together, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run up client free, which is essentially the thing that listens. And if I split this off, just so you can see this, woo, there we go. If I split this off, just so you can see what's going on here. Whoops. Right. This is the problem with such small space. So this one here, we're going to run fake client two, which is going to send the, the information. This one's going to receive because it's subscribed. And if I send that now, you can see as I send in here, this one receives. So you may actually think at this point, OK, this is all very cool. This is how we can start building our chat room. But you can also use this type of system for talking between server processes if you wish. Um, it's not just for doing front end to back end. Um, you know, we are talking between two different server side processes here, essentially. So let's make this um, a little bit more complex. So what we might want to do is we want to create um, an HTML file that will do some of this stuff for us. So let's say we'll keep the one that's doing the subscribing, but we want something uh, at the HTML side that will do the sending of the message. We can get rid of this fake client 2.js. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into a file here, which I've already created, because this is the boring bit to type out and play with. Um, just a very, very simple HTML5 file. Um, basically, it's loading in jQuery, which we're going to use very sparingly. Uh, it also loads up fay.js, which is being served up by um, the Fay server that we have here automatically. It already comes with Fay. We can access it through this way. Um, a style sheet, and then nothing else. So what do we do at this point? Uh, well, we clearly need to put something on the screen that is like, um, like let's say, a button, for example, that's going to actually send our message if you click the button. So I'm going to create a button, and I'm going to call it send, and it will just have click me on it. Um, and this is just to keep things really simple. Um, we'll have something that also provides some output. Um, and this is for when we get to actually doing the subscribe as well here. And I know you can all scream at me for this, but this is, um, I'm just doing this really like off the cuff and making sure this is really simple to understand. In the real world, you would hope you put this in a separate uh, JavaScript file, include it properly and all that type of thing. So we can see it all in the one. Um, I'm actually going to do the, um, the code here. So what we're going to do is we're going to only, once the, all the DOMs loaded, which won't take much time at all for this, um, we are then going to create a client. And because we've loaded in that fay.js, the you know the fay object is all there, ready for us to use. Local host, going on a Scottish tip there. Um, I'm going to connect to fay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, send, create another function, and this is basically where our message is coming back again. Um, someone in the channel said, yes, do as he says, not as he does. Um, really, this is like one of these things where you're learning, where you do things a scrappy way just to learn. And then once, you do, once you've learned like, you know, how to do something, then you can kick the ladder away and start doing it a different way. Uh, this is a very good example of that. Um, obviously, this would be a very horrible way to do a full-scale app, uh, just doing it all in the HTML. But it works for us, this quick example. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to pass in the J um, JavaScript object again. Uh, we'll say hello world from browser this time. Get our semicolon on the end there. Right, so what we're doing, this is very, very simple um, to, uh, very, very similar, sorry, to, what was it, fake client two. There we go. So if you look at this code here that we use to send messages to the server, and we go back to bare bones. This code is essentially the same thing, except we've attached it to, when you click the button, it will send the message to the server. So if we save that, and what I'm going to do is I'm running something called, um, actually, I'll do this manually so you can see what's happening. 
if you are, have got Python on your system, which you do if you're on OS X, um, Python will actually share it with you. Oh, I'm already doing it, aren't I? Um, get rid of that one. There we go. Run it again. Um, this will actually share the current directory on port 8000 for you. Um, so it's a really nice way of making up a very simple web server on the fly. Um, the reason we're going to do that is because we are going to come and load up our HTML file. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So you're seeing the end before we get anywhere here. Load up my bare bones. So I've got my click me button here. I've got my face server sitting here. Now if I click this button, my face server will not work. Uh, so I guess I should have a quick look as to why that might be. Um, if I quickly look at my console, uh, all right, I've obviously um, messed up and put uh, a nasty semicolon where I shouldn't have put a semicolon. Uh, well, I should have asked it what line that was on. Do, 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 line 20, 20. All right, yeah, keep making that mistake. Get rid of that semicolon, start again. Bring this all up again. This is what I like about live, you know, mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. It's good to see some. So there we go. So now what I'm doing is I'm live sending from a browser to a back-end process, and it's receiving that information. So that's one, uh, you know, doing one direction, essentially. Well, what if we now we want to do two directions? We want to do, you know, obviously when we have a chat app, we don't just want to send messages to people. We also want to receive them. That's why I created this output div here. So what we can do here um, is we can uh, do a subscribe. Now, if you remember the code that we used to do a subscribe, I'm actually going to steal this code. I'm going to bring it up into here. And remember, we've still got clients, so we can do a subscribe message. We can keep this all the same. But what we want to do is we don't want to do a console.log because that's not much use to us. What instead we want to do um, is we want to get access to our output div, which is here. And let's add on to the start of that um, what the message text is. Um, and we'll also add in um, a break tag, a line break for that. So there we go. Right, now if I reload this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up another window. It's exactly the same. Now, we don't need to worry about the server at all at this point, um, all that back-end stuff, because we can just now stick to the browser. So we've got two going now. Reload that one. Right, so if I click click me in this one, you can now see it's being sent across the channel and both of the browsers are receiving it. Now, you know, you could do stuff like have a user ID um, that's passed along in the object and strip out any messages that you've already, uh, you know, that you sent. You might not want to receive messages that you already sent and stuff like that. But for simple, you know, sake here, we can just see that there's two browsers talking to each other um, through the face server. So this is the very basic, like, uh, you know, raw beginnings of our uh, chat system. So how can we make this more advanced? Well, we can do things like we can bring in um, a text box, for example. So, for example, we could do something along these lines. Um, text, uh, I'm not going to have any styling, actually. Um, I'll say we've got a uh, user input, and I'm going to put a placeholder in this HTML5 thing, which makes it look nicer. Uh, so we'll say type and press enter to send, like so. And then what I could do is when we send the message, Instead of just doing it the uh, you know the way that we were doing it before, um, what I can do is is do, 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 hang on there is I can say take our user input, uh, get its value, and send that instead, please. So we're not just sending hello world now; we're actually sending something a bit more useful. Uh, did I lose? I lost my other window, didn't I? We'll bring it up again. So, like so. Right. Um, oh, I've just realized, actually, we don't want it to work with the button. We actually want to work it when you press Enter, um, which is a mistake I've made. So, let's bring me back my code here. Um, we don't want it to be on the send there. We want it to be uh, when the um, user input, uh, when we've pushed the, ooh, here we can get rid of that. Um, when we've pushed the enter key, which is uh, code 13, the old ASCII thing, uh, what we'll do is that. Um, or actually, we also want to clear the input box. 
uh, when someone's actually sent something. That's just fleshing out the functionality a bit more. So we'll restart that. Oh, we can get rid of that button now as well. Right, nice and clean. So we've got two of these up and running. So let's put in something like this is a test. Now you can see both browsers, we get this is a test coming up. Now at this point we have a very, very basic um, chat engine. So you know, blah, blah, and so on and so forth. Well, again, just because of the time, um, I'm going to show you something a little bit more full featured that I was going to look at. Um, works on a very similar process to this, has the same code in it, just a bit more stylized um, because of that CSS file that I created. So we go look at index.html. Now, what we're going to do here is make sure that this all works. Get rid of that. Right. Switch the client across. Right. This is a slightly more advanced version of what we were just looking at. Um, and what this is doing is, again, we've got our, um, you know, our uh, text box here for typing our code, um, you know, typing our uh, chat into. We've got um, a section that we're going to put the chat in, and I'll explain this bit in a minute. What we do is we create a user ID when we come in. And the reason for this is that you might have a box that says, I'll oh, type your nickname or type your real name in or whatever, um, and you send that with each message so that you know who is chatting at a certain time. Um, just for simplicity's sake, I've cheated. And what it will do is for each client, it will create a random number um, between um, 0 and uh, 100. Um, essentially, and you know, just the reason for that is it's a lot easier than having to put another box up and read that in and all that type of thing. Um, but if you ended up doing authentication, for example, you would, you know, obviously have a username and then all of that plugged straight in. We create our client again, still localhost, etc. We again subscribe to messages and we prepend the message into the chat window. Again, we send the message in the very same way. Um, and another little nicety I've added is that it will automatically focus on the chat box. Now, if I run index.html, um, and I type stuff in, you can see one of them's ended up, this is basically ended up with code zero in this chat room. I'm zero. Um, and this chat room is, seems to be 90. So you can see this chat going backwards and forwards, and you know, the stripes, they're done with CSS and that type of thing. Uh, very, very simple chat room. But this kind of is horrible, like all this port number and all this type of thing. You know, how can we get this to something that is closer to what we would deploy for real? Well, we would create a slightly better server. Um, and I've created one here called full server. And let me just explain how it works. So if we look at our very basic Faye server, we literally just load up HTTP, we load up Faye, we tell Faye to get on with its work, and bam, off we go. Well, I actually want a server that's going to serve up the um, index.html as well. And luckily, Node um, has a library available to it called Node Static, which will allow you to serve up any files that are in the current directory um, in a static way. So when you hit the web server, you don't need to put in index. Or, you, know, um, you don't need to have a separate Python server running like I've got at the moment. And I'm actually going to close that, just to illustrate the point. Um, it will actually run it all through the Node app. So you've, you've got your chat, you've got your static files, any images that you might have, all that can all just go through the one. So we connect our Node like we did earlier. Uh, we create a new static server. This is part of Node Static. Uh, we create our HTTP server. This looks very familiar from earlier. Um, and then we say that you know once the request is finished, you know if we get to this point, serve up um, any files that have been requested, so like our index.html or whatever it is that's come in. Again, attach Fay to the server, and listen on port 8000, please. Um, and for people asking the channel, yes, we are going to have uh, all the code is available to download. I'll give you the URL um, once we're done. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run up this server um, instead of our old server. Uh, whoops, what's happened here? Da, 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 da. All right, yeah, I've had this problem before, actually, um, because things actually changed since I wrote this code. Um, and doing a node. I think I need to upgrade my uh, package, possibly, for this. Da, da, da. What's going on here, then? Not sure what it's. Something wrong with node static. Um, 
which is not cool. Um, this is the one bit actually I didn't test before for doing this webinar um, because I actually gave this uh, talk to a, a local user group um, a few weeks ago, um, and this all worked fine. Um, but it seems like my node is not very happy with this. Um, so just to rescue the situation, I'm just going to have to say what would happen if you ran um, this code when it works. And what I'm going to do is is I will um, update the zip file with code that does work. Once we finish this, I'm going to go and get the right code, put it in, um, and you'll be able to download that. Um, what would happen is, essentially, when you come into your web browser, we wouldn't need different port numbers. This is the main thing. So when we're running on port 8000 from our Node app, everything would happen through there. So both the face server and the HTTP server are all in the same place. So that when we're in our index.html, we can do code like this. We can get rid of um, this line and just have this line. So it's loading fay.js from the local server. And when we're creating our client for our fay client, bam, we don't need to have all this local host 8001 or whatever, because that wouldn't work online. Um, you know, it would uh, use the local version of fay. Now, yeah, the reason the thing about the no static thing is, um, is I did test all of this on Heroku earlier today, so I know it, if the code is fine and it works. It's just because I'm running an edge version of um, Node, as I explained earlier, the 0.7, so that's why things have changed and things don't work quite so well, um, unfortunately. But when we get, we're going to do the deployment thing in a second, and you'll see that it all works fine. So just ignore that. It's just a little snafu um, in, our, uh, in our lineup here. So what I'll do is I'll actually show you the full example when it's running on Heroku instead, because I know it actually runs there. So let's get to deployment. Now, I'm just going to bring in a little slideshow just so that you remember what the structure is for this stuff. So it's a little diagram I produced earlier. So bear in mind, on our client side at the moment, we've got the, the browser, which is just doing the rendering of the page. We've got our JavaScript, which you've seen is doing the talking um, you know, to the face server. We're using the Fay library to do the talking. That then communicates with the, you know, the Fay library on the other end, which is running on Node.js, which is running on V8. So the bit that we want to deploy, essentially, is all of this part um, on the right-hand side, the server side. The client side, that will just stay. Um, you know, that's just what's running um, in your browser. You're requesting over the wire. So we don't need to worry about that. So I've got an app available here. Now, what I've done is basically this is just a copy of the files that I've used from further down here um, into um, you know, a system where I can actually take it and deploy it to a system like Heroku. Now, let me just show you how this works from scratch rather than just deploying it because that won't teach you anything. You know, how do we actually get to that point? So let's go into app two. If you're not familiar with Heroku, you should definitely check them out. What I'm going to do is I'll just bring Heroku up here. Heroku is basically like a cloud hosting system. But the cool thing about hosting on Heroku is that if you're running something that's quite small and low powered, you can use it for free. So if you look at the pricing here, um, you know, the co cost is zero uh, for doing something very, very simple. Um, but if you start ratcheting up the numbers of servers and things that you want, the price can go up very quick, so we're up to $500 a month already. Uh, so if you want to scale, it's a really great system because you can start for free, get very basic system, and then just scale it up as you uh, go along. Now, you could use your own VPS or uh, hosting system for doing this. You couldn't use shared hosting because most of them don't support things like Node. Uh, but if you had, let's say, a VPS from something like uh, a Linode or um, you know, there's lots of different companies that uh, offer these types of things, um, you could just take those scripts that I was showing you earlier, those uh, Fay scripts where I was running the Fay server, so like uh, da -da 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 -da, the full server app, you could take that, um, run that on your server, um, and then, you know, run, you could even run it on port 80 and have like Nginx or Apache uh, proxy requests through to your, um, you know, your node face server here, and bam, it would all just work very, very good. Um, but I want to show you how to use Heroku just because it's very, very simple um, and allows you to get started without having to mess around with setting a VPS up. So what you would do is, if you were starting from scratch, you would go to the Heroku website, you would sign up, um, there's a sign up yeah, button on here. Um, 
you would get all of that, you would go in, you would create a username, password, it asks for loads of information and stuff like that, and eventually you would have a uh, login all ready to go. Then what you need to do is you need to install the Heroku tools which run through uh, Ruby, um, and also something called Foreman which will allow you to test uh, what it's going to be like when it deploys, uh, but locally. Um, so it's very easy to install, and there are tutorials about how to do this. Um, let me just quickly show you it. Uh, so Node.js on Heroku. So if you want to follow through with a thing, it's very similar to what I'm going to show you later. Just search for Node.js on Heroku, um, and they have a tutorial about deploying a whole um, Node app onto their system. Quite long. Where it's going to sit the absolute basics. Um, then you would get into your system, you would do something like a Heroku login, um, and this is where I can put in my um, Heroku credentials, which uh, you're not going to see, unfortunately. Um, you know, that will get you into the system, uh, and then what you can start doing is, is you can start setting up um, a brand new Heroku app. And what you need to do is you need to do some preparation before you can actually get things running on Heroku, because for example, if we look at our server here, we're connecting on port 8000. Well, what if, you know, a thousand people uploaded their app to Heroku and they're all using port 8000? Well, it wouldn't work. Uh, and this is because, you know, Heroku shares machines and they only have a certain number of you know, ports and things like that. Um, you can't all just share ports. So what you would actually do is, like I've done in this version of the server, it's slightly different, uh, I ask, has the um, environment, does the, uh, you know, is there an environment variable called port, which has been set, and Heroku will do that for us. It will give us a, a, you know, a different number that they've assigned for our process. But if not, use 8000. So this means it will run both locally and on Heroku just fine. Uh, and then we print it out and it will say what port we're going to run on. Now, the next thing we need to do to create a Heroku app is we need something called, uh, called a package file. And I've created one here already called package.json. And this is basically just a JSON object. Um, you need to specify the name of your app. So I've just called it my app too, but it could be chat system or whatever you like. You know, it's um, not a big deal. The version of your uh, system. Um, and then you can put in what the dependencies are that you want to rely on. So in our case, we want to rely on the node static library and the Fay library. So that all works fine. Um, and then what we can do is, and this relates to what I said earlier about being able to install packages without needing to do npm install, blah, 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 all the time. Uh, once you've got that file, you can just go npm install, and it will read the package.json file and install um, you know, all of that stuff for us. So that's great. Um, and that's exactly what Heroku's system will do automatically. That's why they need this package file, so they know what to install at their end to make our app work. Next, we have something called a proc file. Now, all this proc file does um, is it just tells uh, Heroku, essentially, what are you going to run. And all we want it to run is we just want it to run you know, Node, of course, uh, with myapp2.js. So this is just like us at the command line doing that. Um, and of course, we've got that error, unfortunately. Um, but essentially, that's what's going to happen at Heroku's end. They're going to just run our myapp2.js file. Now, what we can do, and because, of course, you can see this is um, busted here, unfortunately, but if it was all working, we could do um, Foreman start. And Foreman is a, a Ruby library which will um, allow us to you know, follow proc files, essentially, in the same way that Heroku does. And what would happen is you would do start, and it would say, oh, right, we're all started. It's on port number, whatever, and you could do local tests. Unfortunately, I have this broken process here. Um, and just remember, actually, I did test this code earlier, but I tested it on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> That's why um, my laptop has a nice version of Node on it. Um, so let's pretend everything's worked and we're all ready to deploy. Well, what you would do usually with Heroku is you would set up the local directory as a Git repo, um, and then you would create a Heroku app um, running on that repo. And you would do that with git init dot, and then you would do um, you know, all the normal things that you would do with Git. And if you don't understand Git, unfortunately, you go and search for Git tutorial. Um, you, know, you need to know how to use Git, unfortunately, to use um, Heroku. It's very much based around Git. Uh, but essentially, you would initialize a Git repository, add all of the current local files, um, and then you would uh, create a Heroku app, like so. And what this will do is it just tells Heroku, please create um, an app you know, at your local, at your end for me, um, that then I can push my um, app up to. 
And then what I'll do is I will push what I have, my code, up to Heroku. Now, the problem here is that there's so many people on the um, chat that if you all try and access this URL at once, I think it's going to blow up. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale up the web process. Make this it makes the web process run, essentially. It loads up the Node.js for us. So that's now running. We can check that it's running by running Heroku PS, which checks the process at the remote end. And yep, it's running. And what I'm going to then do is I'm going to access this URL in my browser. Whoa, what's going on here? Oh, I just realized why this is. It's because I've already actually created a Node app um, in this uh, current repository, um, and it's trying to create a, a second one for me. So let me just try and fix this up. Right. Let me get the right one here. I think it's this one, actually. This wouldn't happen to you, because it's because I'm trying to create two apps in the same folder, which you can't actually do, um, and it will break. So here we go. Right, I've got the correct URL this time. So it's called Vivid Journey 9249. So I can put in my information here. And this is actually now running on the remote server using that actual code you've just seen. And I just see someone else has already jumped in um, without me <laughs> even saying to do so. So yeah, if you want to try and reach that uh, URL, give it a go. But I suspect Heroku is going to turn around any second and say, there are too many people accessing this. Um, go away, essentially. And that's what will happen with Heroku. Um, but what you can then do is, you can from the command line, while you're chatting there, I'll just show you, you can come up and go Heroku uh, PS scale, and you can update the number of servers there are. So you can say two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. Um, but what will happen is, if you do that, is they will want to charge you money for it. So if your credit card is registered with them, beware. When you start scaling up to different um, levels, it will then start charging you. Um, but to me, this costs uh, nothing, because I'm only running this on one at the moment, remember? Um, there's only one process running, um, and you know, using one dyno, as they call it in the Heroku world. So yeah, just keep, no, you're not charging me any money. Keep, just, just yeah, go, go for it. Um, see if we can blow this chat room up. Um, but that is the absolute basics. Um, and I'm very sorry for that mistake um, in the middle there with my dodgy version of Node that I should not be running. Um, but if you're running Node 0.6 point whatever, that code will then work. Um, sounds like I should probably re-record this just to get rid of the mistake. Um, so that kind of brings us to the end of the deployment thing. So this is a very, very simple chat room that I promised you at the start. Um, and this code is available. We're just going to go back to the slides in a second um, just to finish off a few things um, and then move on to the Q&A. Um, but this code that we've been working on is actually already available online, and you can get access to it. Uh, so you can then, what you could do is you could push this up to your own Heroku page, and you could have like a chat room for your, I don't know, like a, you know, let's say you wanted to have a live, um, you know, like a user group meeting. I go to lots of user group meetings, and perhaps you've got a projector, and it would be nice to have a live shared, um, you know, a chat room up on the projector while you're all talking at the user group. Well, you could literally rig this up on Heroku, give everyone the URL, and bam, you get this, uh, which is basically lots of crazy people posting crazy messages to everyone. Um, so yeah, it seems like this is working really well. Um, and this is all working over Heroku, um, and you're all seeing what's going on, basically. Uh, just to reinforce the point in case anyone's going to ask this, this is not using WebSockets. This is using um, Ajax to do this. So even though it looks kind of real time, it's not using WebSocket as you would expect. And the reason for that is that Heroku doesn't currently support WebSocket. I believe NodeJitsu does, which is a different platform. Um, but the good thing about Fay and also Socket.io is that they are very graceful. So they will downgrade to this. Um, and it just works. And yeah, someone says Comet. Yeah, that's what this is using. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I know this is all very fun looking at this chat room, um, quite enjoyable. Um, and stop posting rude pictures on there. Um, I'm going to close the uh, screen sharing, um, go back to the slides, because um, there's just a few things that I want to finish off and uh, explain to you. So um, yeah, you can keep chatting in the chat room if you like. Uh, but I'm going to close the screen sharing now. Next.
So where could you go next with this? Well, you could add in um, an authentication system or a proper web app system or something along those lines uh, where, you know, you have a username and password and all that type of thing. Um, you know, it's not particularly complex to do, a bit beyond the scope of this talk, but it's all very possible as a reader exercise. Um, if you want a very simple reader exercise, though, you'll be able to download the code and add in another field to the left of the, you know, where it says type and press enter to send. Add in something where someone can type in a username rather than get a user ID automatically assigned to them. That is perhaps the simplest reader exercise I could give you. Um, just add a, a very simple type your name in and off you go. Um, and this would be very useful if you are going to do a, um, you know, a chat room for your user group or anything along those lines. Um, yeah, it's probably the simplest exercise to do. But then you can move up to authentication and putting a password on it and all that type of stuff. Um, all lots and loads of fun you can have with that. So where is this source? Well, I was a bit stupid, really, and I, I put it on my local server, which I just realized, like, almost a 1,000 people whacking that is not going to be good. So what I've actually put in, if you go to that URL, it will redirect you to Amazon S3. So hopefully it shouldn't blow up. Um, this will allow you to download the file, and if it doesn't work for whatever reason, just please wait, like, five minutes or whatever and try again, because there's obviously quite a lot of you um, hitting this. Um, I could actually bring up my live log file and just see what the stream is, but I don't want to see my server blow up, so um, just go for it. Uh, I'll just keep that on the screen another um, 10 seconds before we move on. Um, someone's saying, can you download this webcast? You will be able to later. Um, O'Reilly are recording it, uh, which is a shame because everyone gets to see all of my big mess up in the middle, but uh, that's part of the fun of doing live. Um, we'll do it live. It's fun. Right, so just to give you some last-minute resources before we wind this down and move to the Q&A. You can follow me on at Peter C um, for personal stuff. If you want to keep up with JavaScript news, I've already mentioned JavaScript Weekly, but you might already be on that anyway. Um, but I also have a Twitter account called JavaScript Daily, which will post two to three um, JavaScript links, often things that don't make it into the newsletter, sometimes more frivolous things. Um, just a nice Twitter account that you can follow if you like.